Good evening to all those who are joining us in United States and a very early morning to those who would be joining us from India. Uh, I welcome all of you for this webinar on yoga and science by uh, Dr. Subhash Kak. Dr. Kak is a highly acclaimed scholar with expertise spanning from information theory and neural networks to archaeoastronomy and Vedic studies. He is the Regents Professor of Computer Science Department of uh, Department at the Oklahoma State University, Stillwater, and recipient of the Padma Shri awarded by Government of India for his contribution in the field of science and engineering. Yoga is an invaluable gift from our ancient traditions. The word yoga is derived from the Sanskrit uh, root yuj, which means to join or to unite. It symbolizes the union of body and mind. Uh, thought and action, and harmony between man and nature. The International Day of Yoga is observed on 21st June every year across the world, which underlines the global significance of yoga and its benefits as a holistic approach to health and well-being. The theme for this year's International Day of Yoga is yoga and wellness. The current COVID pandemic has highlighted the need for making healthier choices and following lifestyles which are fostering good health. In the words of one of the most famous practitioners of yoga, the late BKS Iyengar, yoga cultivates the ways of maintaining a balanced attitude in day-to-day -day life and endows skills in the performance of one's actions. The practice of yoga helps in boosting the respiratory and immune system, dealing with lifestyle-related diseases, stress, and for leading a healthy life. This year, on the occasion of the International Day of Yoga, various community, social organizations, and yoga institutes have planned virtual events, including talks by experts like Dr. Kak, who is joining us today on yoga and its benefits, and demonstrations of yoga techniques, which can be done at home and integrated into daily life. Dr. Kak has also extensively written on science and various Vedic topics, I'm sure you can. You are all aware of the various themes he covers, but do take out the time to see the various books and literature he has written. His book, Mind and Self, Patanjali Yoga Sutra and Modern Science, a commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, talks about the new findings from neuroscience and physics that throw light on the counterintuitive working of the mind. Dr. Kark, this is truly a very enigmatic subject for a lot of people and uh, yoga and science, I think is them thematically a very relevant, uh, highly relevant in today's world. So with that, I welcome you for this talk of, as, as we have planned after you have delivered your initial remarks, we will have uh, Dr. Anjali who will be moderating this session of uh, the Q and A with you. Over to you, Dr. Kak. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be a part of the uh, International Day of Yoga celebrations uh, being organized by uh, Consulate General of India at Houston. Uh, as um, you said, uh, the, uh, the, the question of yoga has become of uh, increased importance in recent years for a variety of reasons. First of all, the cost of health uh, is increasing exponentially in all societies. And uh, the pandemic has brought this question to the fore. Why is it that some people are much more susceptible than some others? And clearly it has something to do with the immune system um, or immune health of individuals. And so how do we address that? We cannot address health only from the perspective of uh, a a, 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 an approach where everybody is considered to be exactly the same uh, individual. So we must have more of personalized uh, approach to well-being and health, which is what yoga does, because yoga looks at each individual as a unique person uh, so that for such a person to treat uh, his or her body in a fashion so that uh, if one were to look at uh, it from the perspective of uh, uh, of a of a once in a lifetime situation such as the pandemic, 
how does one strengthen uh, the body's resources to deal with uh, the threats that exist. But beyond that, to be able to, uh, first of all, decrease uh, stress in one's life, to be much more productive, uh, to have access to what uh, modern medicine has been quite uh, intrigued by, namely the placebo effect, because we know, modern medicine knows that about 30 to 40% of the cases, just uh, the sense that the patient has, that the patient is being given uh, medicine, even if all that is being given is a sugar, uh, seems to cure people. In fact, the placebo effect even works in surgery for about the same uh, percentage of cases. If uh, a patient uh, has gone through a sham surgical procedures, uh, a considerable number of such patients will recover. In fact, they can even have side effects, even though nothing actually had been done. Therefore, from this perspective, uh, how the mind and body interact with each other and how the mind uh, has the capacity to influence the well-being of the body is of the greatest importance. And uh, I think um, allopathic medicine, as we know it, uh, has touched its limits, especially when it comes to chronic diseases um, and, uh, you know, uh, such as arthritis and uh, pain of one kind or the other, elevated blood pressure. Um, and, and, and therefore, um, we need to harness yoga to the extent we can uh, to give each individual uh, the capacity to be in control of their own health, uh, to their own well-being, because certainly body has its own intelligence, and uh, the case has been made by a lot of people that uh, disease is really this of ease of where the body finds that it's not being allowed to find its own optimal state of health um, for a variety of reasons, for uh, reasons associated with uh, the disconnect between the two, between the body and the mind. And so I think uh, in, on in these celebrations related to uh, the International Day of Yoga, I think what we need to do is to provide all the tools that we can to each individual who is uh, watching the program or on their own uh, are trying to find out what uh, uh, yoga can do for them. Now, of course, uh, there are uh, different aspects of yoga. Um, for most people, yoga are the asanas, uh, the poses which one uses in one's uh, exercise routine. But uh, in the Patanjali system, before the asanas also come ethical preparation. So I think yoga is much more than just physical exercise. It's also ethical preparation of oneself to be a better human being. And if you are a better human being to other in one's relationships, then you're also a better human being to yourself. You, as somebody has said, you have to love yourself to be able to love others. You have to treat yourself well in order to be able to treat others, others well. So it does all of that. And beyond uh, just uh, the question of well-being important as it is, it also opens up uh, an entire world related to mystery of ourselves, mystery of our nature, uh, which is uh, the mystery of consciousness. As you know, from the perspective of science, because this is one of the research areas that I work on, um, we know that the computer machine does not have consciousness while the brain machine does. So where does consciousness emerge? Um, scientists tell us is the last frontier of science. And this is a frontier that each human being can explore on their own, in their own way, uh, whatever their um, point of focus or whatever their temperament uh, guides them towards. You can approach uh, uh, consciousness from the perspective of creativity, for example. If you are a business person, you can be creative in a business uh, uh, situation or an artist, a dancer, a musician, or a scientist, or as a student uh, studying in school or college, if you 
can have access to that creativity within you, which is really a potential that everybody can have access to. Um, clearly, uh, you would be much more successful. And if you're creative, you'll also be more happy. In fact, uh, one of my uh, personal uh, understanding that I've arrived at is that, um, first of all, every human being is a unique individual to whom um, gifts have been given so that they can be creative. And if uh, their conditioning or their education takes them to a uh, situation where they're not able to reach uh, this creativity and express themselves, that is one of the reasons for stress. Because if people feel that, they're, uh, that they've not uh, accomplished as much as they should have, and in some sense they have fallen short, uh, that's because they have not, for a variety of reasons, reasons uh, pushed on them by the education system or their conditioning uh, by society, um, which uh, sort of puts them down and tells them that you can't do this and you can't do that, which should not be the case. Almost everybody should be able to do much, much more than uh, somehow they are told that they can achieve. And therefore, yoga has this potential as well, uh, beyond wellness. And I think uh, we should do, as uh, coming from a tradition where yoga uh, was born and has been nourished over millennia, whatever we can do from the Consulate General of uh, India in Houston and the larger community of Indians and all the other yoga lovers from all cultures and backgrounds and ethnicities in the US and India, we should do whatever we can to bring these finer points related to yoga and the inner worlds that they open up. And uh, I, for one, would be more than happy if uh, there's anybody who wants uh, more information. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with me or join up with me on social media and I'll be more than happy to respond to any specific questions you might have. But uh, briefly, just to summarize, I can tell you that uh, yoga provides each individual, no matter what background they are from, where they are from, every human being is equal in this journey of yoga, and each person can open up uh, new worlds within them and find extraordinary capacities that they were not aware of. And these, are, these capacities are also promised for those of you who have uh, read the Yoga Sutra or looked at it. In the third part of Yoga Sutra, uh, different vibhutis or uh, different um, capacities are uh, shown to be at the end of your practice. So um, I would uh, hope that uh, you would take my words as um, a point of inspiration for you to do this uh, exciting journey on your own. With these uh, initial remarks, so let me stop and uh, looking forward to the interaction with uh, Dr. Anjali uh, after this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapp for your remark remarkable insights. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Anjali Kanojia, PhD. Dr. Kanojia is an accomplished academician, yoga practitioner, and teacher. Her education and training are in health policy and administration. She's interested in enhancing public health and well-being among adults and young children. Dr. Kanojia teaches for and volunteers at various institutions and organizations across the greater Houston area. Care for caregivers is one of her passions, and she has worked with various displaced populations and refugees around the globe, utilizing yoga therapy as intervention. Dr. Anjali, over to you now for the second part of today's session. Thank you. Um, and again, as we just heard Dr. Cock, we know that we have an extraordinary human being in our presence. So I'm going to jump into a Q and a right away. So, Dr. Cock, as you mentioned, yoga being a personalized and a unique system. How do you think we should link yoga and Ayurveda um, in the greater health narrative? 
Uh, for example, it is difficult to kind of test Ayurvedic medicine and its efficacy with the existing framework, while yoga we see is being tested more and more by behavioral uh, researchers and scientists around the globe. So how do we kind of make that link um, between yoga and Ayurveda to frame a health narrative? So, namely, both yoga and Ayurveda at the same basis, namely the whole Vedic complex to reality. And what this uh, complex uh, says is that you, of course, have the body, but you also have consciousness infused through your body. And the mind is a mirroring of this consciousness. And therefore, if you can clean up the mind, to use a kind of a broad image, you clean up the mind or still it, which is what the Yoga, Yoga Sutra says, uh, the nirodha of the vrittis of the chitta, which means uh, stopping all the eddies in your conscious mind uh, so that you are more at peace. If you are more at peace, then you can reflect of that consciousness with greater force and clarity. And therefore, you are able to see things both within yourself and outside, outside of yourself with greater clarity. And if you see things with greater clarity, you are, first of all, you have much more control because often uh, stress emerges because you feel that you are losing control. You are not quite clear what is happening. The, the more uncertainty there is, more stress there is, right? And therefore, how to reduce uncertainty by having a sharper vision, which is what yoga gives us. And as an adjunct to Ayurveda, because in Ayurveda, uh, the question of mind is a, is a essential component of the entire uh, approach um, uh, to looking at the mind-body complex. And therefore, uh, if a Ayurvedic patient is also um, a practitioner of yoga, uh, it will be much easier for him to uh, arrive at a positive uh, outcome for whatever situation that person might be in. But um, I, just to make a slight point related to testing of Ayurvedic um, uh, practices, well, I guess it's harder in the sense that being personalized to make the cohort where a certain uh, medication or uh, intervention is being tested is, is difficult, but it's not impossible. So in other words, one's got to give more thought to designing of, uh, of, of that cohort. But, but I think all of that should be done. I think the time has come because uh, um, clearly um, allopathic medicine has reached its limits in many aspects of health. And the results of that are obvious in things such as that from 70 to 90% of all the clinical research papers that are published in medicine cannot be replicated. And they're not being replicated because the way their uh, uh, testing um, protocols are being designed are not really very effective. And therefore, when somebody else does it, it doesn't work out. So I think we should be hopeful and we should be hopeful that Ayurveda itself will find a greater acceptance um, all over. Thank you. And since you mentioned the mind, I want to kind of take us through another question. In Western biomedicine, the body and the mind are often seen as separate constructs, which have different protocols and methods for healing. How would you describe the mind from the yogic perspective? Uh, from the yogic perspective, uh, mind is an inner instrument, antahakaran. So mind is not something that we have no control over, which gives us agency. You know, in the Western uh, perspective, mind is something unknown, amorphous. We don't know what it does. So it's, it's a kind of a wild being within and you're told to do this or that and hope that doing all of that, you will be able to break this wild horse and then possibly will be much more effective. While in the yogic approach, you 
actually know or you have practices to master this inner instrument. And therefore, it's a much more optimistic and a much more positive approach to dealing with the mind. And, and, and I, I sort of think that that is the right approach also from the perspective of science, because if you look at quantum mechanics, which is the deepest scientific theory there is, uh, consciousness is supposed to be a category uh, orthogonal or independent of material construct. And therefore, at least we have one scientific framework which seems to be consistent with the yogic framework. Thank you. Um, continuing with the scientific inquiry. So um, yesterday I pulled up uh, the word yoga on Google Scholar to see what pops up. And about 880,000 articles about yoga pop up, of course, your work being amongst it. Um, given the popularity of scientific studies on yoga for various illnesses and conditions, is science finally trying to catch up with yoga? And also relatedly, uh, why might there be any kind of resistance to yoga in spite of this amazing evidence? Um, sometimes this resistance we also see in India. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think in contrast to China, which has pushed uh, Chinese traditional medicine in a very comprehensive way, they put a lot of money in it. And I think in China, Chinese traditional medicine gets about 20% of the health budget. In contrast, in India, Ayurveda gets, I believe, 1% to 2%. It's crumbs. So Ayurveda has really been starved. Our yoga as a therapy has been starved in India. In fact, it might be easier to uh, find people who would help you with yoga in the West than back in India. And I think what uh, should emerge uh, as a takeaway from the International Day of Yoga is a recommendation to the government to sort of accelerate the process of uh, helping the Ayurvedic and yoga program so that maybe in the next 10 years, if uh, from 1.7 percent, if it goes up to about 10 percent at least in the next year by 2030, that will be a great thing. And once that happens, there would also be greater acceptance in the West because right now in the in China, there are a lot of integrated hospitals that have been set up where you go in and some patients, for whatever reason, considering their situation, are uh, rooted through uh, Chinese traditional medicine and some go through allopathy. I think we need to look at out-of-the-box approach, uh, which um, parallels this, because in India, whatever is being done, uh, at most, we have private or we have separate Ayurveda hospitals, and there's really nothing by way of yoga in hospitals, as far as I know. There could be private programs, um, or there could be institutions such as the one we have in uh, Bengaluru, uh, the, uh, the yoga university. Uh, now, American uh, hospitals can have in-hospital yoga programs but we don't have that, that as far as I know in India. So I think most of the resistance comes from the fact that India has not pushed it as hard as it should be. And the first push needs to be within India so that we have enough um, interlocutors for yoga and Ayurveda. Uh, firstly, on the Indian stage, and then many of these would transition to the Western stage. Mm -hmm. um, like a second part of that, and this kind of gets into a little bit of politics, but do you think that this is just a question of budgets or is it something um, inherent within us that we just haven't activated yet to see these modalities as being viable? I think it's both because uh, the budget um, is certainly always a problem uh, because if uh, you were supporting something with only 1.2% yesterday, then an increase of even 20% will take you to maybe 1.4, but it's still nothing, peanuts. I think the other is a deeper philosophical thing. After independence, for a variety of reasons, India decided not to uh, include in its uh, science and training programs any of India's own sciences, because India also has Shastras, 
which are sciences like Ayurveda is a Shastra, okay. yoga is one and there are many others. So they were sort of put under the religious basket, which was a huge, huge mis mistake. And therefore, after that, there is such a strong lobby against giving any space to India's own sciences that it's a big political issue as well. Uh, if you, you know, for example, in recent months, the American Medical, uh, this, the Indian Medical Association has been fighting uh, Ayurveda, and um, and so that fight is not going to go away. But I think such fights need to be managed much better. And if uh, if people in the West are so much more open to having yoga and Ayurveda, I think. Um, maybe certain interlocutors from the West and go to India and say that, look, why are you doing it? We are all in it together. Ayurveda is a science. Yoga is a science. Allopathy is also science. They each have their own place. So let's be in it together and make do whatever needs to be done to look at the challenges of public health, because those challenges in the unfolding future where jobs will go away, large number of jobs will go away because of pervasive automation, where people would be much more stressed than they have been in the past. We need to do whatever can be done, taking help from all different ways of uh, delivering public health as is possible. Okay, wonderful, thank you for that. Um, next question is, the six darshanas or the six philosophies that have originated from Indian subcontinent, they overlap, of course, but yoga darshana has enjoys its own category. Um, how would you describe this particular category in comparison to Vedanta? And I'm, essentially, I'm getting to the question of religiousness. Um, often we just get, is yoga Hindu? That question pops up um, in every sense. So I want to hear your thoughts, please. The, the darshanas are different ways of approaching reality. There are six darshanas because if you are in a room, there are six walls, right? So each darshana is one way of approaching reality. One is logic, the other is physics. Uh, third one is uh, creation at different levels, which is Sankhya, and then there's yoga. And finally, there's Vedanta, which is looking at uh, reality in its most general form. Uh, now, they are all sciences. So yoga is a science. It's a science of the self. It can be even viewed from the perspective of psychology, both theoretical and applied. Now, from another perspective, you can say that yoga is, um, is Veda in, in, in practice. You know, you have Veda as philosophy or as abstraction, as knowledge. And then how you live this knowledge is what yoga is. So uh, I think the problem that arises sometimes is really goes back to those decisions that were taken 70 years ago that uh, we will not do any of India's own sciences. And then all of those sciences have been clubbed under the heading of religion, right? And so now we are fighting over it. Really, yoga as psychology, if yoga was taught, uh, as a standard mainstream discipline of psychology in India, then there won't be any dispute about this at all, right? And likewise, uh, yoga should be a part of the medical programs in India. And I think this whole uh, division, this false division that you can only do, that allopathy can only be done the way it's been done in the West, maybe allopathy can also introduce some of these things. So we need to do some finessing of the opposition, which there always is when you do something new. And, and that's where clever leadership, good leadership, where everybody is reminded of the larger issue of, and what is the larger issue is related to public health, uh, of delivering delivery of capacities and instruments to each individual so that they can deal with their own health. So, so long as we focus on that, perhaps some of the opposition will go away. Mm -hmm. um, great points. Do you think it's possible to, to introduce um, 
yoga at an early age in Indian schools. I know many schools are doing this already, and even the Ministry of Ayush has a particular protocol. But in the US, we see that there's a quite a bit of challenge, and we've seen some litigation uh, around this yoga being Hindu or yoga being a religion. So how would you kind of compare contrast um, the US and India in terms of introducing yoga at an early age in the school system? I think in India, uh, yoga is uh, taught in schools, uh, in private schools. It may not be taught in government schools because of uh, various uh, uh, political reasons or the way things have been done. There could be certain opposition, but I'm not quite sure of all the facts on this. Um, I think if at all there is any opposition, because you know, you go to any country, in fact, I was at this uh, major conference in Delhi a few years ago, two or three years ago, there was this lady from Saudi Arabia and she was telling us how popular yoga has become in Saudi Arabia amongst women. And then there was another lady from Iran. She was talking about its popularity in Iran. In my own travels in Europe and elsewhere in South America and Australia, I find that yoga is very, very popular. You go to the smallest town and you have a yoga studio. So yoga, has sort of conquered the world. But uh, there is a lot that remains to be done as far as delivery of different aspects related to yoga are concerned, uh, because there is, you know, it's not just the whole system, the, the whole question of marketing of it, of question related to whether people who are teaching it can, um, can make enough money, you know, uh, as, a, as a professional. Um, now, this question could be perhaps even more important in India uh, because the, the, the fees may be much lower. The fees that uh, students who participate in these classes may be much lower in India as compared to the US. So there are all of these questions so that people need to come together and see, and see hey, what are the challenges and what needs to be done um, to dispel the misconceptions. Now, there could be some misconceptions. So you know, put it out in the open. This is what you do, and this is where it is. Um, I, and then I think that would help uh, quell some of the, uh, the, the the doubts that people have. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Yoga sometimes has become different things for different people. I mean, I know that in the West, primarily, it's like the gym yoga, the asanas are the most popular or that is just seen as comprehensive yoga, right? Just the postures. Um, and even in India, I mean, this particular practice has gone from the US around the globe back to India. And this is what's being uh, kind of expected and taught in, in yoga studios in India. So my question is, and this is a heavy question, is there a way to kind of go back to the roots in any way? I know some of the, um, the Hindu American uh, organizations have kind of started some of the initiatives to kind of taking yoga back to its roots, right? And relatedly, um, what role can the Ministry of Ayush play in kind of standardizing uh, some of the guidelines for yoga teachers? Well, uh, my own take is that while in India, we depend on the government all the time, uh, and that can be helpful because government has huge resources. Every, every country's government has much more resources than any private individual. But that comes with a price. The government, by its very nature, uh, given that it will have a corresponding bureaucracy and so on, has limitations. And I think uh, uh, oftentimes the power of Western institutions comes from the fact that it, these are voluntary bodies. You know, there could be a yoga uh, association, and then they start. Uh, uh, certifying individuals and so on. And uh, it raises funds from the members of that body. So I think in my view, and my view could be mistaken, India would be much better served and yoga would be much better served if something needs to be done. And perhaps there Ayush could give the push and provide some help, but it should really be people driven. It should be bottom up because if it's bottom up, then People in that organization back in India would know, well, what further needs to be done? How do we go outside of India? How do we create branches all over the world? Now, if there's something being done by the ministry, 
I would think that it'll be much harder for them to think outside of the box, right? Because in the ministry, everything comes from top down. Top down. Mm -hmm. All these top down things uh, work very slowly. So this is what my personal advice would be, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the yoga uh, groups, Indian yoga groups uh, within India, first of all, uh, within the US should also band together and then uh, join up with uh, groups in India. And if no such groups exist in India, possibly uh, help in the birthing of such groups. And for that, one can certainly approach the Ayush ministry and other ministries um, for funds and perhaps approach private groups because there could also be great business uh, aspect to it. If it's done properly, yoga could be a multi-billion multi tens of billion dollar industry. And we are losing out on it because we have still not woken up to doing that needs to be done. I mean, we had, we had done a lot, but still from a business perspective and from a health and wellness perspective, we haven't done enough. Okay, um, fair enough. Thank you. So, so then I guess it is time for yoga lobbies to be formed both here and in India. Um, so what can policymakers and the healthcare industry and pharma do to kind of support yoga as an intervention and a viable therapy? And just looking at Brazil as one of the examples, um, the insurance company pays for some of these yoga sessions for patients. How do we begin to introduce that here, especially uh, the challenge being if there's no agreed upon definition of what yoga is and isn't? I mean, I'm coming back to the standardization question again. But what should be the first step, even from the bottom up? Well, uh, you know, the reason why the bottom up approach works uh, better than the top down approach, because with the bottom up approach, you have the, the lobbying group or the yoga association group doing or joining up with the insurance companies and possibly also taking the help of the government from the side. You know, if Indian government comes here and it, it's harder for the Indian government to put pressure on insurance companies. But if the group which is doing yoga um, or certifying yoga is a private group, the Indian government can approach their counterparts in the US administration and say that, look, we want assistance in this. And look, this is all, you know, this is not, you're not going to be doing it for us. This is your own, you know, yoga group. So I think the whole politics would change. Uh, and, and so lobbying is extremely important. And, uh, and we need to, the yoga uh, lovers uh, of Indian ethnicity in this country need to devote a lot of attention to what needs to be done to help the emergence of these lobbying groups or associations within India, and there could be more than one. There could be more than one. And uh, if, uh, they, if the insurance uh, pays for it, I think that's an extremely important point because uh, the insurance in companies in Europe pay for Chinese traditional medicine because the Chinese government has batted for it. And they, are, they have done whatever needed to be done to push for it in, in, uh, in, in Europe and in the US as well. Acupuncture, for example, and uh, and I think perhaps it all comes from the fact that since the government support for yoga and Ayurveda is still it's it's much better than twenty years ago, but if it's still at one to two percent, it's really in total dollars. It's not so large so that it has the kind of strength to first of all be a you know major player back in India as well as here. <laughs> Um, thank you. The next question is, um, we see that yoga, including med meditation, is, is often kind of, um, people try to kind of dissect meditation from yoga. What would benefit, I guess, everyone in terms of teaching folks what yoga is? And we go back to the Ashtanga class, the, the eight steps and not just the asana. So so what can we do to um, help people understand that meditation is not a separate construct from yoga in your experience? Oh, oh absolutely. I think I think that's a, that's a great point. I think uh, once uh, 
depending upon how a association does it, uh, that dhyana, dhyana means uh, meditation, right? Uh, mindfulness is dhyana. So how mindfulness is a, is complementary to the asanas. Firstly, uh, it's also the yamas and the niyamas, you know, the ethical preparation, which is, of course nobody will have any uh, fight with. That those are universal principles. So we're talking of universal principles of preparation plus the asanas plus mindfulness. Uh, which is dhyana, and and if uh, that is uh, um, consciously stated, I, I don't think people would fight that. Um, it's only when somehow it's brought in as something mysterious. It's not mysterious. It's mis mysterious because we use the term mindfulness, which one doesn't know what it means. But the moment you say it is concentration or it's focus of your mind, training the mind, as we said in the beginning, you know, in the Indian way, the mind can be trained and you can then dissect it, you know, that is, of course, brings you to esoteric aspects of one's own personal journey. We don't want to get into that, but certainly uh, this can be stressed much more. And then everybody would know that the asanas are only the first step. But I think in any event, most people do know, you know, most people who get into asanas at some point start exploring uh, the further aspects to it on their own, even if their teacher or instructor does not talk about it. Okay, thank you. And probably the last question, and if you don't mind sharing, would you tell us a little bit about your personal yoga practice? Not, oh, not that will do too much. <laughs> absolutely, I do uh, asanas every morning, uh, several of them. And, um, and uh, you know, my work, of course, involves dhyan because it's concentration, right? You have to be focused, which I must uh, confess is not so easy in this uh, modern age of social media and so many distractions. And so it's always a challenge, but we must all fight that challenge. Uh, and uh, one can overcome uh, if you have found a passion. Once you have found a passion, then it's much, much easier to fight these distractions than otherwise. But I do... Uh, do uh, have a asana routine that I do every morning. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Park, for these enlightening responses. You've given us so much to think about. Um, and I am personally, of course, very grateful to have this opportunity to ask you these questions. So thank you for, for this today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anjali Kanojiaji. Great to meet you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kark and Dr. Anjali for this really interesting interactive session. It was quite informative and I'm sure all our viewers must have benefited a lot from the discussions. With this, we come to conclusion of today's session. I request all our viewers to celebrate International Day of Yoga with same enthusiasm as they do each year. This year too, there are several events lined up, the details of which can be accessed at our website, yogadayoftexas.org. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Namaste.